Welcome to the lecture, Complications of Pregnancy During the First Trimester, Bleeding. Bleeding is common in pregnancy, but we don't consider it normal. When a patient comes in complaining of bleeding, the nurse must obtain a history. When did she start bleeding? How much is she bleeding? Is it a simple stain on toilet paper, or is she bleeding like a regular period? When was that last period? Therefore, what would the calculated gestational age be at this time? What was she doing at the time that provoked the bleeding? Was it after intercourse? Was it after straining to have a bowel movement? Does she have any pain associated with the bleeding? All of these questions and answers help lead us down the path of why is she bleeding. So you can see that there are a variety of types of abortions and we're going to go through all of them. The general principles related to our nursing care include rest for a threatened AB, although this has not been proven to really make a difference in the outcome, but certainly no intercourse because it causes the uterus to contract. For all types of abortion and these different, the bleeding is a threatened miscarriage, but we term it abortion. We want to count and weigh the pads, and if there are any clots that are expelled, you need to keep them because there may be products of conception within. We may need IV fluids if her vital signs point in that direction. We assess for a fetal heart. Now, if she's only seven weeks, we're not going to be able to hear it with a Doppler. We're going to look for it on an ultrasound. The RN does not do the ultrasound, but they can certainly listen with the fetal heart Doppler. If the patient's vital signs indicate that she is going into shock and she is hypoxic, we'll start oxygen. Some women do bleed profusely and may need to end up with a blood transfusion. If a woman is RH negative, once the pregnancy is terminated, we want to give Rogam. And then if the pregnancy continues, we're going to monitor her antibody screen and give Rogam later in the pregnancy. And last but not least, do not forget to provide emotional support and assess how this woman is coping with the possibility of losing her pregnancy. When we look at causes of spontaneous abortions, chromosomal abnormalities is one of the highest reasons for pregnancy loss. Teratogenic drugs may cause that, because remember, many women take medications early in pregnancy, they don't even know they're pregnant. There can be problems with where the fetus implanted, the cervix may be weak and it causes incompetence. There can be issues with the placental and then there can be a variety of maternal conditions that don't allow her to continue pregnancy. So for spontaneous abortions, one of the things we do is an ultrasound. And we are going to find two things. Does the gestational age of the products of conception that are within the womb equal that of the menstrual dates? And if the baby is far enough along after six and a half weeks, is a fetal heart activity present? We'll put the woman on bed rest. And if it looks like she is going to lose this uh, baby, then we would prepare her for a DNC. When we look at a threatened abortion, what happens here is the patient is having bleeding with cramping as well as low back pain. If she's feeling pelvic pressure, that increases the risk that she is going to end up with an inevitable abortion. Now the difference, and it's important you understand this, a threatened abortion, although they all have bleeding and cramping, with the threatened, the cervix is closed and the fetal heart is still present. An inevitable abortion, 
We may have a fetal heart present, however, there's not a thing we can do to save it because the cervix is open and products of conception are already coming through the cervix. An incomplete abortion is that products of conception have been passed. However, some parts still remain in the uterus and this will cause continued cramping and bleeding. So what happens when the products of conception remain in the uterus? We end up having to do surgical intervention to evacuate it. A complete abortion is when the woman is able to expel all products of conception on her own. And there is no need for any type of surgical or medical intervention. A missed abortion occurs when the fetus is no longer viable. Everything is still within the womb. She has cramping, she has bleeding, and the cervix is closed. So what do we need to do? we need to evacuate the uterus. So our discharge teaching from the clinic, on the phone, or from the emergency room is to discuss the bleeding. If it's light, that's great. Let us know if it gets to be any heavier. The patient may experience bloody discharge for up to two weeks and this is after losing the baby. If it's only a threatened miscarriage, we hope that that bleeding is going to stop within 24 to 48 hours. We must teach the patient that she's to keep anything out of the vagina. No tampons, no douching, no intercourse. If she's at risk for infection, then we would discuss the antibiotics that the provider prescribed. Acknowledge that she is grieving and needs to heal because the minute they found out they were pregnant, they get an image of what this baby is going to look like at term, even though it may be very early in the pregnancy. We can make referrals to their uh, church clergymen, uh, counseling if necessary, and, and to support groups, especially if there's recurrent pregnancy loss. Some providers recommend that a woman delay trying to conceive for three months after having a miscarriage. So we'll follow whatever their guidelines are. When we have a missed abortion, remember that's when the products of conception are no longer viable, but they're still sitting in the uterus. So for example, the patient comes in, she's 11 weeks, says that, gee, I'm just not feeling as pregnant as I did three weeks ago. And on exam and on ultrasound, it's only an eight week gestation fetus and there's no longer fetal heartbeat. That increases the risk of uh, an infection and of the woman developing disseminated intravascular coagulation. And this will be discussed in another lecture. So this ends the lecture on bleeding in the first trimester. <laughs>